Hi there. Thank you for joining me once again in our study in 1 Corinthians. My name is Stuart Gould. It is such a pleasure to bring this study to you. Today we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and we are going to start at verse 7 and we're going to go down to the end of verse 24. Paul is dealing with a lot of things that are hard for us sometimes here to understand. He continues to talk about husband and wives and how that should go through, but then he starts switching over and telling us to be content where we are, to understand that our calling, that our relationship with him is about that. It's about relationship, about walking with him, about knowing who we are in him. So I think this is really going to help you. So come along with me today and see how we can assist you in your walk with the Lord. Once again, thank you for joining me in our study in the book of 1 Corinthians. As I mentioned already, we are in chapter 7, and we're at verse 7. Paul has been dealing with a question that was sent to him about whether a person should remain celibate or whether they should get married. And he's dealing with this in a way that is kind of helping us. And we started in this, this last session, and we're going to continue on. He said, of course, it's good if you don't marry, but of course, rather than sin and fall into immorality, it's better that you get married. And then he's talking about how we need to respect each other and help each other out in our marriage. So let's just continue on in verse 7. He says, I wish that all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, one another has that gift. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So Paul is continuing with this question. He says, I wish that all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. Paul was celibate. Paul did not ever marry. He recognizes that as a gift. It's a gift here. Now, we talked about last time that there's some organizations that demand their leaders, some churches demand their leaders to be celibate, and it's caused all kinds of problems because people have been demanded to be celibate who do not have that gift. And that's what Paul is saying here. He says, I wish that all men were as I am, but each one has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. You know, so not everybody has the gift that Paul has to remain celibate. If that's a calling on your life, if that's what you want to do, you want to dedicate yourself to the things of God and you want to remain celibate, then that is a great blessing. And you're only able to do that by the grace of God. It is his grace in you that allows that to happen. If that's what God's calling you, that's what you should do. Then he continues on, he says, Now to the unmarried and to the widows I say, it is good for you to stay unmarried as I am. So if you are unmarried, it's good to stay that way if that's what God is calling you to do, if that's the gifting you have. Because he qualifies this in verse 9, he says, But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. If somebody is unmarried and they have this great desire to be with somebody, if they have this desire in them, it's better for them to marry than it is to burn with passion. It is better to marry than to end up being involved in sexual sin that is going to defile the temple of God, right? Because we are the temple. As we talked about last time in the verse that says that sexual sin is the only one that, that is against our own body. And it's against our own body, which is the temple of God. Amen. So he's saying, if you have that gift, do it. And if you're not married or a widow and you can remain unmarried, then that's good if you do that. Do not do that if you don't have the self-control. If you don't have the grace from God to remain celibate, then it's better for you to marry. Verse 10, he says, To the married I give this command, not I but the Lord. The wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband must not divorce his wife. This is a strong scripture, right? This is a strong scripture in, in this day and age that we're in. Because there is so much divorce in this world. There are times and places 
because I've heard people use this scripture to tell people, no, you should never get divorced. But there are times when there's abuse in the family and there's neglect in the family that is so bad that it's not safe for the wife or children or whoever to remain in that situation. We know that when we trust the Lord that he can do a lot of things too, right? I mean, that's what the whole thing comes down to is about us walking in relationship with God. If we're not walking in relationship with God in our marriage, if your wife is doing one thing and you're doing another, or your husband's doing one thing and you're doing another, and you're not walking together, it's very difficult, right? He's telling us here that we should try our best to, to walk with this person, right? He continues in verse 13, he says, If a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he's willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. You know, don't divorce somebody just because they're not a believer, right? For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through the wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. There's a sanctification that comes to the family. There's a blessing of God that's on the family. There's a, there's a holiness that is on the family because of the believer that is there. Amen. So he says, if you're a wife that's a believer and your husband's an unbeliever and he's willing to live with you, then just accept that. If, you're, if the husband's a believer and the wife's an unbeliever and she's willing to live with you, then that's good for the family because then there's a sanctification there that happens that's passed on to the children. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. So there's a difference whether you have two believers or if you have a believer and an unbeliever. Because he says here, if one of them is an unbeliever and they leave, then you're not bound by those circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? One thing I want to caution in this here, this is true. I mean, we never know what's going to happen. We never know that maybe our life as an example can save our partner. But I've seen so many people get married to an unbeliever thinking that they are going to convert them or that they are going to bring them to the Lord. And it very, very seldom happens in the way that they think it's going to be. And it causes a lot of problems in a marriage. Even when two unbelievers get married and then one of them becomes a believer, you know, it can cause a lot of problems in the marriage because there's two complete different worldviews of how you look at things and how you value things and what your moral standards are. And that all changes, right? And so oftentimes what you see is that there's a mixing of moral standards. There's things that you would do that if you had a believing partner that you wouldn't not necessarily get involved with. Verse 17 says, says, Nevertheless, each one should retain the place in his life that the Lord assigned to him, to which God has called him. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. In other words, whatever gifting, whatever circumstances God has put you in, just abide in those circumstances. Abide in the Lord and walk with him. This is what it's all about. It's all about our intimacy. It's all about walking with the Lord. So if we are doing that, then that's how we can be an example to our partner or to others. And they can see what the situation is. And maybe they will come to the Lord because of that. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he's called? He should not become circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's command is what counts. Now here Paul is dealing with a subject that he had to deal with a lot in his life. Uh, in fact, most of the letters that Paul writes are dealing with this subject a lot more than what he deals with in Corinthians. In Corinthians, he's dealing with a lot of problems in the church, but he's also dealing with this subject. And what was happening, Paul was going around establishing Gentile congregations. He would go to a place like Corinth and he would spend two or three years there preaching the word of God, working during the day and spending time there and building a church. And once a church come to a point where there was people with enough maturity to lead the church, he would appoint elders in that place and then he would move on to the next one. 
But what was happening, there was Jewish believers coming behind Paul, coming to these Gentile congregations that he had established and trying to persuade them to keep all the Jewish practices, all the Judaism that they had to do, the, the circumcision, the keeping the holidays and all these sort of things. And it became such a huge issue that in Acts chapter 15, we see that Paul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem to meet with the other apostles and the elders there and to seek from the Lord what his desire was for the Gentiles. And what came out of that whole thing was that there was four things that God required from the Gentiles. And circumcision wasn't one of them. It was not to eat anything that's been sacrificed to an idol, not to eat any th uh, blood, not to eat any animal that's been strangled, and to keep yourself sexually moral. So these were the only four things that the Gentile church was required to keep, not like the Jewish people who kept all these other things, circumcision and all the holidays and, and remembrances and stuff. So these guys were coming behind and causing a lot of problems. So that's why he's saying here, man was already circumcised when he was called, he should not become uncircumcised. A man who was uncircumcised when he's called should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. This is what's important for us. It's not about what we do in the body. It's not about the works performance thing because that's what the old law was about. The old law was about works, it was about performance. And the new law is not about that, it's about the heart, it's about relationship. Under the old law, if you kept all the commandments, you did everything right, you didn't do what you weren't supposed to do, then you would be God's people and he would be your God. But in the new covenant, we are loved because he loved us first. That's what it tells us in 1 John, that he loves us, that we love him because he's showing his love to us. And Jesus, when he was here, showed us that it's not a matter of keeping rules and regulations, but it's about a matter of the heart. And we used that example a couple sessions ago in the Gospels where Jesus is talking and he says, command is do not kill somebody, but if you have hate for a brother, it's the same as killing him because your heart is wrong. We're under the old covenant. God's desire is that we would work out of our heart, but it came to such a performance of doing and do, not doing that it took away from what happened in the heart, right? So it took away from what the situation was, how we were, were to walk out of a love and a compassion for God, because that's his desire for us. His desire has always been for us to love him and him to love us. What happens nowadays that we are under this new covenant, now that we're under a new beginning where everything is by the heart, we still have this situation just like Paul had in the Gentile churches where we have people trying to bring in so many legalistic rules and regulations into the church that take away from our relationship with God. I grew up in a church that was quite legal in a lot of things. I understand where it came from because, you know, the Bible talks about these things, but it oftentimes when it's talking about fruit in our life, thinking that this is showing something wrong with our heart, we take it as a rule or a regulation, and so then we make it about a rule or regulation. One of the things was communion, because you had to have a single cup for communion, because in the example in the gospel, he took, a, took the cup and blessed it and passed it from person to person. Well, you know, it's not about whether we have one cup, multiple cups, or whatever. That's not the issue. The issue is remembering Jesus dying on the cross. It's not the manifestation of how we do something, but it's what we are doing. What is the heart issue of what we are doing? What is, what's in the heart? What is it about the heart? What are we trying to portray? What are we trying to uh, fulfill? And this is what's important for us. So he's just saying to these guys, you know, don't get swayed in by these people that are trying to draw you into something, you know. Just accept whatever situation that you're in. Each one should remain in the situation in which he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is a Lord's free man. Similarly, he who was a free man when he was called is the Lord's slave. Basically what Paul is telling us here is to be content in whatever situation that God has given us. 
Now, he's not telling us that we shouldn't better ourselves. He's not telling us, because he said to this person, he said, if you were a slave when you were free, be content with that. If you can get your freedom, okay, fine. Now, we don't have that situation because we don't have slavery anymore, but the heart of the thing we can understand, right? You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brothers, each man is responsible to God, should remain in the situation God had called him to. What a powerful scripture this is here. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of man. It's not man. It's not people who have bought you. It's not a situation or an organization. We have to be so careful, right? We have to be so careful how we walk, that we are walking with the Lord who paid the price. It is Jesus who paid the price. And that's why Paul is dealing with a lot of what he's dealing with is the attitude, well, I'm of a Paul or I'm of a Paulus, I'm of a Cephas, you know, I follow this one or that one. And he's trying to get to them. It's not these people that bought you with a price. It's don't become slaves of men. We are to walk with the Lord. That's why it's so important for us to have an understanding of the gospel. That the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is not just that we die and go to heaven, but that we become children of God and that God wants us to walk in intimacy with him. And I know I've talked about this so many times, but it's so important for us to understand because this is why we were created. This is what God's heart is for us to walk with him. This should be the goal of every one of us as Christians to walk in relationship with God and to walk hand in hand with him. It's not about the situation we're in or what, what's going on. It's about walking with him. If we don't have that goal, if we don't have that understanding, if our understanding is only that, well, when we die, we go to heaven, we become a very shallow Christian. Depth and growth only come out of walking with the Lord in relationship with him. And the destiny he has for us only comes when we walk with him in an intimate way. We come to our end of our time here for today, so let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this situation. We thank you that we can walk as free people, Lord, that we can walk in a situation where you have come to set us free. But the freedom is not the situation of our physical being, but it's the situation of our spirit and of our heart. So Father, I just pray for each of us in our heart that we could be free, that we could be free to know who we are, that we can walk in an intimacy with you and know that you love us and that we love you. And that's the calling that you have called each and every one of us to. Father, we just pray for those who are in difficult situations that it's mentioned through these scriptures that we've read. Lord, we just ask that you would be with them and that you would encourage them to know that there is a God that loves them unconditionally, wholeheartedly, who desires to walk in intimacy with them. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity we have to share your word, and we just ask your blessing on it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember, God loves you so much. His love is unconditional, and I love you too. Until next time, take us home, girls.